Hey, what's up you lot, Path here. In today's video, I want to be building up a framework so that we can understand what I think is one of the coolest theorems in quantum mechanics, Ehrenfest's theorem. I'm actually going to be splitting this explanation up over two videos. In part one, that's this video, we will be looking at quantum operators and commutators. And right now this looks and sounds all weird and mathsy, but don't worry, using just a basic knowledge of high school mathematics, we're going to be able to understand what operators and commutators are. In part two of this little mini series, we'll be learning about something known as expectation values, something that's really important in quantum mechanics and something that you might be familiar with if you've studied probability theory. And finally, we'll be putting together everything we learn in this video and in the beginning of the next one to understand what Ehrenfest's theorem is trying to tell us. And like I've mentioned already, you only need to be familiar with like high school level mathematics to understand what's going on here, at least at a basic level. Oh, and yes, I realize my quarantine hair is getting longer and longer. I'm gonna get a few comments about this, so I thought I'd mention it straight off the bat. But if you, <laughs> before we start, if you do enjoy this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Okay, let's finally get started. Okay, so this is Ehrenfest's theorem, and like I said, it looks really daunting, but the really interesting thing about it is that it can be thought of as a link between classical physics and quantum mechanics. Classical physics, of course, being everything in physics that came before Albert Einstein's era, and quantum mechanics being the weird, strange stuff that we'll be looking at in this video. But before I explain exactly what each term in this equation means, we need to lay down some groundwork. The first piece of information necessary to understand Ehrenfest's theorem is a really important idea in quantum mechanics in general. It's known as an operator. If we happen to be studying a quantum system, that is, something that we're using quantum mechanics to study, where that system could consist of, for example, a single electron, then an operator is a mathematical object that we can apply to this quantum system, or more specifically, to what's known as the wave function of this quantum system. Now, I realize I've thrown a fair amount of jargon at you, so let's decode what I've just said. We've said that our quantum system in this case is a single electron, and a wave function is basically all of the mathematical information that we know about our system. Specifically, the wave function is directly linked to something known as the probability distribution of our system, which gives us information about things like how likely we are to find our electron at certain points in space, and other things like that, but basically it is a probability distribution. So it gives us information about the likelihood of certain experimental results when we make a measurement. In this particular case, the measurement that we're making is a measurement of the position of the electron. I've talked about this in a lot more detail in a previous video, so I'll link that up here if you haven't seen it already. But this brings us nicely onto the idea of an operator. Like I said, an operator is a mathematical entity, a mathematical object, and we apply this mathematical entity to our wave function. And in real life, this is equivalent to making a measurement. In order to make things a little bit clearer, let's take a specific example into consideration. Let's talk about the position operator. This operator is labeled with the letter X, X for the X position of our electron along the X axis. And we put a little hat on top of this operator because all operators are labeled with little hats. Now, if we were to make a measurement of where our electron is in space, then mathematically, this is equivalent to writing this. We have applied the position operator to our wave function. And this eventually ends up giving us some information. We're not gonna to talk too deeply about that, but let's look at x psi specifically. First thing to think about is notation. We've written our operator on the left-hand side of our wave function ket. And again, I've talked about kets and bras already in previous videos, so I'll link those up here as well. But every time we see a wave function and then we see an operator to the left-hand side of it, then we know that that operator has been applied to our wave function, which is equivalent to making a measurement on our system. And the fact that we write the operator on the left-hand side, by the way, will become important shortly. But at this point, we should really talk about a fundamental difference between classical physics and quantum mechanics. In classical physics, making a measurement is pretty trivial in many ways. For example, let's say I've got a cricket ball. We can make a measurement of the position of this cricket ball, no problem. I stick a ruler next to the cricket ball, photons bounce off the cricket ball and off the ruler, and I have information about where that cricket ball is in space. Whereas in quantum mechanics, making a measurement is kind of a big deal because quantum mechanics tells us, or at least the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics tells us, that before we make our measurement, there's some probability of finding it here, some probability of finding it here, some probability of finding it here, and so on and so forth. Before we make that measurement, we can only work out probabilities about the location of this electron. And it doesn't just apply to the position operator either. This works for other things as we'll see shortly. But when we make a measurement on our system, this results in a fundamental change to our wave function. This is known as the collapse of the wave function. 
because before we made the measurement, there was some likelihood of finding our electron here, here, or here. And after we make the measurement, we know, at least for that very short moment in time, that our electron is in one specific place. So the wave function has fundamentally changed. And this is because the probability distribution has changed. It's important to note, though, that I'm not saying that the electron itself moves or collapses in any way. What I'm saying is that the wave function of the system changes, and making a measurement is what caused that change. So making a measurement has genuine consequences for our system in quantum mechanics in a way that it doesn't in classical physics. When we make a measurement for the position of our electron, for example, for that tiny sliver of time when we've made that measurement, we know that the electron is here. So the probability distribution is 100% here, 0% anywhere else. But very quickly, that probability distribution starts to almost spread out. So we become less and less sure of where our electron is as time passes. And this is in accordance with the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation tells us how the wave function changes over time. But actually making a measurement on our system caused our wave function to change in a different way, not determined by the Schrodinger equation. Now, you should realize that I've skimmed over a huge amount of detail when it comes to talking about making measurements on quantum systems. The most important thing for us to know here is that making a measurement has real consequences on our system through the wave function. And mathematically, making a measurement is written using an operator on the wave function. And we've talked about the position operator already, but a couple more examples of different operators are the momentum operator P and the Hamiltonian operator H. Now the Hamiltonian is the big boy in quantum mechanics. You'll see this written everywhere. You'll even see it in the Schrodinger equation. And this operator in most cases is actually the total energy of the system operator, because it accounts for kinetic energy and potential energy. Again, not super important for us here, but it is good to know about the existence of the Hamiltonian, because it's gonna crop up later. Side note, by the way, here's an exercise for you. Try and work out why the kinetic energy term in the Hamiltonian is written like this, with the knowledge that P is the momentum operator and M is the mass of the system, in this case, the electron. So we've seen that making a measurement has a fundamental impact on a quantum system. But before we go any further, there is something I should clarify. When I talk about making a measurement, it's not the existence of a conscious being that's making a difference to our system. It's actually the interaction between our system and whatever we use to measure it. A lot of people like to very heavy handedly talk about the importance of a conscious being to quantum mechanics, but this is a very subtle idea. The act of measuring is very, very important, true. But the existence of a conscious being doing the measuring is not really what we make it out to be. There are a lot of very clever scientists working on this topic, and it's not as simple as saying we are conscious and therefore everything in the universe exists because we are there to observe it. Anyway, let's come back to talking about operators and the application of operators to quantum systems. Because we've seen that making a measurement can fundamentally change the behavior or properties of a system, making two measurements is even less trivial. It's even more complicated because now, the order in which we make these two measurements matters. Going back to classical physics, going back to our cricket ball, let's say we were to measure the position of our cricket ball first, and then we were to measure its momentum. Right now, its position is x is equal to five from our origin, and its momentum is zero. But if we were to measure these two quantities the other way around, momentum first and then position, then we'd still find that momentum is zero, and position is x is equal to five from the origin. No big deal, right? Well, this is not necessarily the case in quantum mechanics, because measuring the position of our quantum system changes the wave function of our system. So when we measure its momentum afterwards, we're actually making a measurement on a different wave function. And so mathematically speaking, if our initial wave function before any measurements was psi, then px psi is different to xp psi in general. Not always, but in general. In other words, measuring the position first and then the momentum of our system can yield different results to measuring the momentum first and then the position. And we know which operation is done first, by the way, by seeing which one is nearest to our wave function. So in this particular case, the x, the position operator, is nearest to our wave function, so that is done first. And then we measure the momentum of the system. Now, because px psi is not the same as xp psi, this means that subtracting one quantity from the other is not going to give us zero because these two values are different, whatever those values may be. Like I said, we're not gonna go into too much detail about that here. And based on this idea, we can come up with a neat little mathematical trick. If we first start out by factorizing this expression, it's not quite the same as the factorizing that you do when studying algebra and maths, but it kind of looks like it, so we'll go with calling it factorizing. And then we can say that this quantity inside the brackets is known as the commutator between x and p. So first of all, the commutator is written with square brackets around the two quantities. And the reason that we define this commutator is because it tells us whether the order in which we make these two measurements actually matters. 
In this particular case with position and momentum, it actually does matter because our commutator is not zero, which means that measuring position first does not give us the same result on our system as measuring momentum first. And specifically for position and momentum, this is actually true for when we measure these two quantities in the same direction. For example, when we measure the position along the x-axis and we measure the component of our electron's momentum along the x-axis, we say that these two operators do not commute. In other words, the order in which we make these measurements does matter, and we need to be careful which order we make these measurements in. But we could think about two other generic operators. Let's call them A and B. It doesn't matter what they are. But we could have a scenario where measuring A first and then B gives us the same result as measuring B first and then A. In that case, the commutator would be equal to zero because AB applied to our wave function is the same as BA applied to our wave function. So those subtract to give us zero, and hence the commutator is zero. And in this particular case, we say that A and B do commute. And this is quite similar to actually saying something like two times five is equal to five times two. The order in which we do this operation, two times five or five times two, does not matter because it gives us the same end result. And so we say that the multiplication operation is commutative because we can swap the order of the two things being multiplied. But as we've seen for quantum operators, this is not always true. Order matters. Now, coming back to commutators that are not equal to zero. In other words, the order in which we make two measurements matters. For our purposes, we don't need to go into too much detail about what the right-hand side of this equation actually means. We just need to know that if it's zero, then the two operators commute and the order in which we make measurements doesn't matter. But if it's non-zero, the order does matter. Okay, at this point, let's pause. So far, we've learned about operators and commutators. We've seen that operators are mathematical entities that correspond to making a measurement on a quantum system in real life. And we've also learned that commutators are a useful mathematical tool in helping us understand whether the order in which we make measurements on our quantum system actually matters. This is where I'm going to end part one of this little mini series. In part two, we'll be learning about expectation values in quantum mechanics, and we'll be applying everything we've learned in this video and expectation values to understand Ehrenfest's theorem. But if we take a quick peek at Ehrenfest's theorem now, you'll see that there's a commutator in there, and you'll see that there's a few operators in there as well. I'll tell you now that A is a generic operator, which means we can replace it with operators such as position, momentum, or other operators. And H, as we've seen already, is the Hamiltonian. And so we see that the Hamiltonian indeed does play an important role in quantum mechanics, as it does in Ehrenfest's theorem. Like I said, though, there's still a lot more for us to learn, and we'll be doing that in the next part of the video, and finally decoding exactly what this theorem means. We'll be seeing how Ehrenfest's theorem sits very nicely in the weird and wacky world of quantum mechanics, but links back to the safe but ultimately problematic world of classical physics. So if you enjoyed this video, then please come back for part two and hit the thumbs up button. It really helps me out and subscribe to my channel if you're interested in more fun physics content. Hit the bell button if you want to be notified every time I upload and check out my second channel where I've recently released some music. I think there's a lot that we've covered in this video. So if I've not explained anything clearly enough or if I've made a mistake, let me know in the comments down below and we'll try and fix that as quickly as possible. Thank you so much, by the way, guys, for 60,000 subscribers. I'm always blown away by all your support. You guys are so wonderful and like you leave me such nice comments. So thank you so much for that. Anyway, I've spoken on for long enough, so I'll see you in part two of this mini series.